just uh, as a recap for those that weren't here the last couple of weeks, we've just been talking about demons, demons from the standpoint of the view back in scriptural time was that these were the souls of the wicked dead, uh, a little different than we view demons today. I don't think demons and false gods are the same. I think demons and false gods are both very spiritually dangerous and are tools of Satan, but I don't think they're the same. So this week we're going to talk about some of the false gods. So in that light, I think it's a fair thing because of thinking about this to uh, that the trivia question will be, and I want to make sure I quote myself right this week, since I tend to mess that up at times. Yes, when the gates of Jericho were rebuilt, um, someone laid his firstborn son, Abiram, at the gates, the cost of his firstborn son. Who was that someone? Who rebuilt the gates of Jericho uh, later during the time of the kings of Israel? I'll narrow it down. And it's in the Bible. That narrows it down. My Bible is two inches, two and a quarter inches thick. So that's fairly relatively narrow. Um, so in uh, who tried to rebuild Jericho? And it states specifically, he laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, and he set up the gates at the cost of his youngest son. It names both, but I won't get that way because that'd be too easy. In accordance with the word of God spoken by Joshua. So that is today's trivia question, the rebuilding of Jericho. Heil of Bethel. Yes, Heil of Bethel. Let's look at 1 Kings 16. Thank you, Johnny. So 1 Kings 16.34 in Ahab's time. 1 Kings 16.34. Heil of Bethel. Rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up the gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word the Lord had uh, uh, spoken, the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. So you could think about that and think, well, you know, what does that mean? He just, you know, he lost his relationship. He spent too much time rebuilding the walls, setting up the gates. But then we can look over at the story of Jericho over in Joshua 6. And uh, Joshua 6, 24, they burned the whole city and everything in it. They put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. Um, but Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent spies into Jericho. Yes. Yeah. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua had pronounced this solemn oath Cursed before the Lord is a man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. And at the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. So I want to mention that, because t speaking soon in the context of uh, Baal and Beelzebub and Asherah and a few of the other false gods, I just want to point out that there wasn't anything particularly unusual about having a death sacrifice uh, in order to pay for a sin. You might know that, boy, that sounds familiar. That sounds like what God did for us with Jesus. He sent Jesus to be a blood sacrifice for us to forgive us of our sins. He required the Israelites to take the uh, best of the flock and sacrifice it for the uh, forgiveness of sins or at least the rolling forward of sins all through the old testament mosaic law he was expecting or he commanded anyway abram to sacrifice isaac abraham to sacrifice isaac um as the uh, blood gift to god and then of course he spared him and had a ram in the brush nearby just at the moment when abraham was just about to put isaac to death so all those things are very appropriate when done in a godly way and in this case it was a godly curse that he did not want jericho rebuilt remember jericho is the first city in canaan that the israelites destroyed they marched around it remember too we started out our study one of the first weeks with the discussion of the commander of the lord's army came and appeared before joshua when joshua kind of went up the night before and looked at jericho and i think he was thinking wow, this is a big, huge, walled city. How are we going to do this? And the commander of the Lord's army that we discussed could have been Christ himself, came to him 
and said, you know, take off your sandals, there's hallowed ground near me, much like the burning bush, too. Very reflective of the same theme through the Bible, uh, of the presence of God, and that that was all about Jericho and the destruction of Jericho. And so then when Jericho fell, God said, do not rebuild these gates, or it'll cost you, or this wall, but it'll cost you your firstborn son. And then if you rebuild the gates, it'll cost you another son. So those things are not odd. What's horrible is when that become, becomes a satanic ritual or a, um, you know, a, a um, worship of a false god, and there's a sacrifice of a human life made. And I think, you know, we're all familiar with that concept of the um, uh, death of a son, sacrificing of a son, and of course, the ultimate sacrifice of a son being that of God with Jesus to save us. Maybe the negative ultimate sacrifice of a son you might think of would be Pharaoh in his obstinacy and not releasing the Israelites and having the firstborn of Israel of Egypt I when the Passover first occurred when God passed through and struck down the firstborn of Egypt those without blood on their on their um, doorposts and and the sash of the door so you know those things are thematically very common and I thought we'd talk a little bit about some of the evil side of these um you know some of the awareness of the false gods I mean uh would be the best way to say that I suppose and I want to just mention one more time, and this is, or again, this is more for me than for uh, any of you, if you don't feel particularly, particularly ensnared, but I've always thought that it's very valuable, very important to keep in mind who God is at all times for all reasons. But maybe especially when you start studying false gods and what people do with them, to them, for them, because of them. I think there's spiritual risk there because the ultimate temptation to Adam and Eve was you can be like God, no good and evil. You could think, hey, you know, these these gods were kind of significant in their society. They're worshipped. And, you know, I probably have as much knowledge of these things as anybody. And you could get ensnared, I think. And I think people do get ensnared into spiritually bad choices. And I think it's just very important to realize that God is God and God's in charge. And we owe all of our obedience to God. And we don't want to be pulled one way or the other by the temptation of a false God. Now, I think that also can sound strange because you may think, oh, I would never go worship Moab. But I think we can see themes with these false gods that still, you know, kind of hold true today because... I think spiritual warfare is still going today. So those are just the background thoughts to saying about Beelzebub. So when Jesus cast out the demon that we discussed last week, and the Pharisees came and said, oh, this man must be casting out demons by, in the name of Beelzebub. And Jesus said, a house cannot be against itself. Why would I, you know, throw out Satan by Satan? We talked about how Beelzebub was a term for Satan in the New Testament days. Um, Beelzebub was sort of the chief of the false gods in a weird sense, if you want to think of it that way. If not Satan, then at least the top of the list of familiar false gods in terms of the uh, day of the first century when Jesus was walking the earth. So as a background, I want to mention of the many false gods mentioned in the Bible, and we're going to mention about um, six of them specifically, um, there are many others that were known in history, but they're not mentioned in scripture. For instance, in the Ten Commandments, all, uh, excuse me, <laughs> in the, well, in the Ten Commandments, we are to worship God and have no images before him and such, and that all applies. But what I meant to say was in the Ten Plagues in Egypt, all the plagues were against false gods. For instance, the darkness plague was God showing power over the sun goddess Ra, R-A, uh, who was famous in Egypt and worshipped because the sun played a prominent role in Egypt. There is a goddess of the Nile and God turned the Nile to blood to show that he was in charge, for instance. So those were, uh, you know, the frog actually was worshipped as deity and 
the Egyptians were not to harm or displace a frog. And so when the plague of frogs came, remember in scripture, it specifically says the frogs were in people's beds and in their ovens. So they couldn't go lay down, go to sleep, and they couldn't go cook food because they couldn't displace frogs. And God knew that, obviously, and that's why that was such an annoying play to the people of Egypt. And it was showing that God was more powerful than their God of the frogs. So those, though, are, while all the plagues were pointed against specific false gods, those false gods were not mentioned. So I'm going to not go through those at this time because, you know, while they are known false gods, they were not uh, mentioned in scripture. So I thought we'd go with the ones that are. So we're going to go, I want to just as an example, read a passage that's close to that. I should have had you keep your finger in the um, trivia question spot, but First Kings 16, right before Hiel Bethel rebuilt uh, Judah, I mean to the Jer Jericho. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, 1 Kings 16, 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria um, over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, some son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. So I want to point out that there are I think three things of particular interest just in this little paragraph. You know, one is that uh, the author mentions that Ahab was extremely evil. He considered it trivial to commit the son to Jeroboam. Jeroboam was, you know, of course, the original uh, king of the top 10, the, the northern 10 tribes, the tribes of Israel, who completely went against God's will. So being more evil than that is, you know, pretty significant. But the, the point I wanted to make is that it says he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, son of the uh, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. So he went against God's plan for the Israelites, which was do not marry the um, daughters of those who are around in the kingdoms around Canaan because it would corrupt you spiritually, right? But this one happened to be named Ethbaal which uh, Ethbaal is a uh, name that basically means priest of Baal. So he was sort of like the, the head of the worship of Baal. And of course, that makes sense. If he is king of Sidon, then he would lead the worship. Back then, kings were almost always the spiritual leaders too, if not considered the gods themselves. So the king became kind of the god of the community. And in this case, his name was actually uh, you know, connected with Baal. So uh, that was a huge significance. So Jezebel, looking at that name, Baal, B-A-A-L, and Bel, B-E-L. This one I wish I had a whiteboard to write on and scroll all over so that you could try to figure out what I mean. But they, with Baal, there are several different ways that it's uh, noted in scripture. One is Bel, B-E-L. So Jezebel, is named after Baal, essentially. And then Baal can be B-A-A-L, as my version renders it here, the NIV, or B-A apostrophe A-L, Baal, or B-A apostrophe E-L, Baal, which also means the L part meaning God. So this would be um, the God Baal, essentially, or Ba. And so all of those mean the same. So if you start reading through scripture and you see a little different spelling, that's what those are. And so when we look at Beelzebub, that one's of particular significance because of what we'll go into here in just a second. So hold that thought for a minute. But when we talk about God versus Baal, for instance, at Mount Carmel, when Elijah went up and had 400 prophets of Baal, 
and uh, versus him to show who the real God was. Those were all prophets of Baal that um, Ahab and Jezebel had brought in. And so Asherah, which it mentions, that was the other thing of significance I was going to mention here at verse 33. Not only did he set the altar for Baal, verse 32, but 33 also made an Asherah pole and did more and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before. And that whole phrase is very significant. But an Asherah pole, as opposed to a Baal, which was usually represented by an idol, which we also discussed last week, you know, the folly of building a, of carving out an idol and then using half the wood to cook your food and half of it to worship. It just doesn't make any sense, which I think is, you know, obvious, clear truth from God. But when uh, talking about Baal, there generally was a figure of a male oriented king like, god like looking um, idol. And with Asher, it's more what we would kind of consider a maypole. In fact, this week, when May 1st hits, there will be people who have maypoles around. That's kind of a similar appearance. I'm not saying a maypole is a false worship uh, or a, you know, a false god in a stick, but the maypole had. Uh, had a long pole and then several ribbons around it and they used different ribbons and different colors different cloth uh, I don't know how much ribbon they have per se uh, but they used different cloth for different seasons of the year and Asherah was sort of the feminine version of Baal so Baal is a god of fertility and that fertility can be human can be crops can be animal you know reproduction and then Asherah was sort of the specific uh, goddess of female fertility. So presumably, if you set up a place to worship Baal, and then you set up Asherah poles, what you were essentially saying is you want those false gods to give you some progeny that would carry on your family line after you were dead. So that's basically how Ahab and Jezebel had their temples set up. Now, most of the temples, and I don't mean to be offensive to anybody, but it's offensive to all of us, uh, but just saying the truth of it, most of the temples were places of illicit sexual activity. And, you know, you hear about, read about in scripture, the temple prostitutes. Well, that wasn't just a term for somebody who hung out at the temple too much. That was someone who sold their body at the temple for presumably the worship of the false god. And so many of these were extremely sexually charged sexually um, illicit, and that had to do with the fertility component of the false worship. So these were horrible places. These were not what we maybe would picture from a flannel graph back in our young days in class where there just was, oh, you know, here's a little building built to bail. These were places where people went and committed uh, very outright obvious sin. Uh, and I will say before the Lord, because God is everywhere. And so this was very offensive on so many levels to God. And it was not trusting God to provide for you, children, for instance, to your marriage. It was trying to force the issue with all this temple prostitution. And so when God says in verse 33, through the author here and through the Holy Spirit, they have also made an Asherah pole. And did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. Remember that terminology. Uh, it's not just saying God was upset. God is redefining himself as Jehovah God, Yahweh God, the one and only God. In that statement of saying that um, they did, it did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, Yahweh um being you know obviously our god and the one and only true god so god was always careful to define i think that he is above all these that were subjects of false worship any questions so far or thoughts and we'll move to the uh, description description of beelzebub anything okay all right i'll go ahead and move over, let's look at um, the term for Beelzebub. So let's look at First uh, Kings 1 now. 
And that is the wrong verse. Hang on just a second. What did I do? Let me turn. I was trying to throw markers in. I threw it in the wrong book. Aha, Second Kings 1. Sorry about that. Second Kings. That's right after First Kings. It is going in order. So the Second Kings 1. It will be at verses 1 and 2. After Ahab's death, well, that's interesting timing, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his room in Samaria and injured himself. So Ahaziah was the next king after Ahab. So he sent messengers saying to them, go and consult Beelzebub, the god of Akron, to see if I will recover from this injury. Okay, so we'll stop there. This one, what I find to be one of the most fascinating stories really of the kings all through there, but um, I'll stop there where he wants to con consult Beelzebub, the god of Akron. Okay, so actually I'll just read one more verse. I don't want to get too far off. On a tangent, but the angel of the Lord said to Elisha the Tishbite, Tishbi, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going off to consult Baals above the God of Ekron? So God was offended, rightly so. His man, presumably, who should be his man, the king of Israel, was wanting to go consult Baals above. So where was Ekron in terms of nationally? What nation? This gets me a chance for a drink of water. I don't want to drink too much. So, what things was it? Mm -hmm. Was it a city? Of Thank you. Yes, that was Felicia. That's one of the five main cities of Felicia, one of which was Gath. We're all familiar with Gath because of um, Goliath being from there. So, Ekron was one of the five. Uh, capital cities, if you will, the provinces that encompass Felicia. Felicia was always the bitter enemy of Israel. And so what the king of Israel was saying was, go to the false god of our most hated enemy and ask him if I'll recover. Think about how offensive that would be to God to go to your enemy's false god and try to find out information. Uh, obviously a very serious error on his part. So the term Beelzebub there is a little different than Baal. Oh, and I wanted to mention too, Mary Ethbaal was the father of Jezebel, and Ethbaal was the Sidonian king. So uh, Sidophoenicia or Phoenicia Sidon, depending on which side I guess you like better and want to name, was also Philistia. So the Sidonians and the Philistians at one point were combined. Later, during the time of Jesus, these were separate nations. And there was, you know, Tyre and Sidon, for instance. But at this point in history, Felicia had conquered Tyre and Sidon. And so that was all encompassed in that same region and was the uh, edge of the Mediterranean Sea, between the Mediterranean Sea and Israel. And so um, when talking about the term Beelzebub, uh, that was a nickname by the Israelites to basically poke fun at the false god of the Philistines, of the Sidonians, of the Phoenician, Sidonian, Philistine Empire. Small empire, but empire nevertheless. So let's look back at a verse that will help us, I think, define that. And that'd be at Judges 10.6, if you want to turn there. So the term, now this is not specific in scripture, but it is known in history. The term the Philistians use, well, let me phrase that properly. In Sidon, the term for the false god was Baal. Just the straightforward, as we just talked about, Eth Baal being the high priest and god, or I mean, excuse me, and king of Sidon, uh, the high priest of Baal. So in Philistia, this was Eth uh, I mean, excuse me, not F, Beelzebul. And Beelzebul, Z-E-B-U-L, and that's spelled B-A-A-L dash Z-E-B-U-L, meant Baal is the prince. And that, that was uh, the chief god of the Philistines at this time. And so they seemingly had Baal 
as their uh, king, Ethbaal, and whose daughter was Jezebel. And then they had this false god that they worshipped more prominently in the southern portion of their land, which was Baal Zebul, the prince of Baal. Now the Israelites had changed that to Baal Zebub, B A A L Z E B U B. And this was the common name for both Dagon and Baal Zebul to the Israelites. We'll talk about Dagon here in a minute. So Beelzebub was the Israelite term, and it, rather than the, this phrase Baal, meaning God or the Lord, to them, and then the prince, Zebul, the prince is Baal, um, then they changed it to Beelzebub, which meant the flies are Baal or Lord of the flies. And you're familiar probably with the book, the fame about uh, rotten kids on island that became more and more evil at time because of the influence of evil in their midst. And that was called The Lord of the Flies. William Golden, Golding, I believe, wrote that. I'm not sure. But the uh, anyway, that The Lord of the Flies was the colloquial term by the Israelites for the false god of the Philistines. Beelzebub, meaning the Lord of the Flies. Beelzebul, meaning the prince. Uh, the, that Baal is the prince. So that was a derogatory term, of course. So really, when um, when Ahaziah said, go and find Beelzebub to ask about whether I'll heal, he was literally saying, go to the Lord of the Flies, that derogatory God, and ask him if I'll heal. And that would, you know, again, would be incredibly offensive to God. So looking at Judges 10.6, I want to go through a few of these. Uh, this is starting out the um, the reign of the judge Jephthah, which was one of the major stories in Judges. Remember in Judges, there are several minor judges, if you will, very short ones, and then some longer so narratives. This is the story of Jephthah. And again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashereths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. So this, and because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry at them, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. So I'm going to go through each of these briefly, because they're all mentioned in other scripture too, but for the sake of time right now, we're using this combo passage. So they served the Baals and Ashereths. We already talked about that. Those were gods of uh, fertility, presumably male and female, the best we can figure out from history. And those originated in the Sidon Philistine territory along the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. The gods of Aram uh, was, um, let's see, I have a note on that, Hadad, Mot, Anath, and Rimmon. Those were there for Hadad was actually a translation of Baal. So the gods of um, Aram were Hadad, H-A-D-A-D, Mot, M-O-T, Anath, A-N-A-T-H, and Rimmon, R-I-M-M-O-N. So those were known gods, and they get mentioned in other scriptures. Um, they served the gods of Sidon, which, of course, was also, uh, during this time, the... Um, uh, was Baal and Asherah. The gods of Moab were, the chief god was Chemosh, C-H-E-M-O-S-H, Chemosh. And there was a later passage, which we'll get to if we have time, uh, over in First Kings, where uh, Chemosh was the, uh, was worshipped when the people were uh, trying to defeat the Israelites and the Israelite God helped the Israelites to provide a, a visual image of blood as if the people had been slaughtered and the uh, king of Moab wanted to sacrifice his son up on the wall to the god Chemosh. The gods of the Ammonites were uh, the chief one was Molech uh, who also was 
uh, sacrifice uh, humans in, in terms of worship to him. The god Molech, M-O-L-E-C-H, was also called Milcom, M-I-L-C-O-M, in some versions. And both of those are forms of the Semitic or Canaanite term for king. So that, you know, that crossover of a king and a false god still, um, you know, is, is so often the connection. Then um, the Philistines, the false gods of the Philistines were primarily Dagon and Beelzebub. And it's possible that these were one in the same. I'm going to tell you, I actually don't think so because Dagon was portrayed differently in idolatry than Baal or Beelzebul. And so, uh, or Baal's above, as we would have called him if we had lived back there. So Dagon uh, was the same word that the Hebrews used for grain, suggesting he was more of a vegetation fertility deity. And uh, says he is worshipped as recent as the second millennium BC. Uh, so up to about the, the 100s. And that... Um, the, he was often described as a reptile with hands, arms, and a face. So he was more like a, an alligator or a crocodile in imagery. So all that sounds strange, except that this is what people do. And that's, that to me is kind of the crazy thing, is that people actually fall into worship like this. And to us, it seems strange because... When we serve false gods, we don't portray them as gods of fertility or Baal or Beelzebul or Dagon or Molech. And I hope you don't sacrifice humans to them. But in, by your soul, you can sacrifice your soul to them. And that, you know, that can be for financial gain, can be for sexual situations, can be for, you know, power. And I think all those things have the, the background in these false gods. And that's why we're warned so strongly about not intersecting with them in our lives, not making them into a part of our lives. So let's look at the uh, classic story of Dagon, which I think you know, but I think it's very important to read about. So turn to 1 Samuel 5. Any questions on those so far? Then I'll ask the semi-obvious question. Okay. Let's turn over to 1 Samuel 5, and I'm going to read about Dagon. I'll ask the semi-obvious question that all of you want to ask but are afraid to. Is the, that, uh, does Baal worship exist today? Is there a temple to Baal somewhere in the world? Is there a temple of Dagon? Is there a temple to Chemosh? Uh, is there a temple to... Uh, Molech, and the answer is really that there's not. There, there aren't specific worships of those false gods. There are the principles, like I was just talking about, you know, trying to sacrifice your relationship with God for a position of power, wealth, whatever it is. And it's interesting to me that those all had very prominent identities in the times of the Israelites and the conquering of Canaan and such. God wanted them all driven out so they wouldn't near marry and interfere with his people. And they have faded with time. My suspicion is that they faded the most when Jesus died on the cross and, and crushed Satan's head. I think that diminished the direct power of Satan on the people um, that he had been directly influencing. When we read at the Last Supper that Satan entered into Judas and he went and accepted 30 pieces of silver to, bet to betray Jesus. I think that seems to be a bit different than the way we perceive of temptation and falling into sin today. And I really think it was that nature of the resurrection of Jesus that crushed Satan from some of his prowess that he had in the world. Now, I could be wrong on that, and that, that would be, you know, I think there is still a ton of spiritual warfare. That's why we're talking about it, but I think that's why we don't identify Chemosh, Molech, you know, all these Bremen 
all these other false gods. Now, it's interesting. If you look at some of the literature, the New Age movement, there are there's the mentioning of a number of these false god names, but it's in the middle of the mentioning of a bunch of other um, characters and dead that you can navigate with and try to find out information. And again, I think that sounds strange to people too, but if you if you want to be a little scared and very interested in what you what is out there, go to a place like Barnes and Noble and look at the New Age book section. You'll find about three racks and just start looking at the names, uh, the titles, and several of them are the names of dead people that are there to consult with you to provide you information on your soul journey. And the belief in the New Age movement is that there is not one unified Jehovah Yahweh God, but that every person is a piece, small piece of God. And you therefore can learn from these prior people what they learned so that you can advance yourself spiritually. Well, spiritually is loosely used there. But they are big on the consulting of the dead that God warned Israel very directly against. And, I, you know, it's just shocking to me how many books are out there that just say, hey, here's what you do. It's simple, straightforward, easy. And there actually are a couple of books that have been published on Molech and Chemosh. Uh, but they are trying to use only the nice characteristics in the books. They don't talk about human sacrifice. They talk about power and insight and experience and things like that. It's a very scary realm spiritually. And I would not suggest buying anything. <laughs> Don't read it. Just look at it and see what's out there because it's shocking. Okay, I'm going to read it. First Samuel 5 real quick. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it uh, from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They then carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. So... Dagon was obviously an existing something. And in my footnote, it says, in Canaanite mythology, the son or brother of El and the father of Baal. He was the principal god of the Philistines so and was worshipped in temples at Gaza, Ashdod, Beth Shan. Veneration of this deity was widespread in the ancient world, extending from Mesopotamia to the Aramean and Canaanite area and attested in non-biblical sources dating from the late 3rd millennium B.C., 3000, until the Maccabean times, the 2nd century B.C., and the Apocrypha in 1st Maccabees, which is a non-canon version, uh, in the non-canon version of the Bible, but it's in the Catholic Bible, 1st Maccabees. The precise nature of the worship of Dagon is obscure. Some have considered Dagon to be a fish god, but more recent evidence suggests he was either a storm or a grain god, and his name is the Hebrew word for grain. So fish or reptile, either way, a scaled creature, not a human-looking creature, except for hands and feet and face. Head, I guess, of a human. So this, you know, this would imply, that footnote would imply that Dagon was above Baal or the brother of Baal, one way or the other, a significant false god of the era. Think for a second with me about this realm that in the ancient world, the worship of Dagon extended from Mesopotamia to the Aramean and Canaanite area. Think about the journey of Abram from Ur the Chaldeans in Mesopotamia up through the land of Aram into the land of Canaan. That it's interesting to me that Dagon had the same pattern of worship that Jehovah God was calling Abram from Ur of Chaldean, uh, the Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans, to go to Canaan and establish God's kingdom there first with his people. It's an interesting uh, combination event there, I think. So they carried the ark, verse 2, into Dagon's temple and sat beside Dagon. The people of Asha rose early the next day, and there was Dagon falling on his face before the ground, on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple of Ashdod step on the threshold because the head and hands of their false god were laid there by God. 
the Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, etc., and they got tumors. So then I just want to mention down at verse uh, 10, uh, verse 10. So they sent the ark to Ekron. That was where Ahaziah was sending for his people to go and talk to the worshipers of Baals above at Ekron. So anyway, this, of course, was a very significant story of how God uh, clearly was above this false god. And they knocked him down, have him facing toward him, worshiping the first day, or they gone turned and worshiped him because he had to. God is God. And then the second day, the head and hands were placed on the threshold as if to say, you know, it's not worth setting him back up because I'm going to be able to move him or place him anywhere I want to. And I've always found that to be so fascinating that the first thing they would see when they entered into the temple would be the head and hands of their God. And think about how that would be a bit of a crushing blow if that is who you believe is in power over your life. That's a pretty significant maneuver there by God. So I think that um, that was a very uh, telling, very significant story in terms of the power of God over the false gods. Any questions or thoughts on that while I find another verse that I forgot to mark? Amanda? I have a different question. I was trying to sure. remember what's the name of the false god that, and I can't even remember which king it is right now, that sacrificed his kids to, like, threw them in the fire for that, a sacrifice was, to it. Yeah. Second Kings 23. Let's look at that. Which one, it, which, which uh, yeah. false god was that? False god, Chemosh. C-H-E-M-O-S-H. Second Kings. Wasn't the Second Kings right after First Kings? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Second Kings. Did I say Second Kings 23? I'm hoping. Hope that's what I said. Because I hope it's true. Hmm. First Kings. Oh, am I having trouble here? Um, I know it was before Hezekiah, but I can't remember. Okay, we're about to find this. I apologize. Some of these get mixed up in my head a little bit here. Let's see. Chemosh. I'll look up. Pretty sure that was the one. For some reason, I thought I... I thought it started with an M, but I didn't think it was Molech, but I may be spelling Molech wrong. Molech starts with an M, M O L E C H, and then Mildod's the other. Um, let's see. The other one that starts with an M, which really isn't mentioned specifically in scripture, except in one obscure verse of one of the minor prophets. Um, let me come on first. This is this a reference is of him in 1 Kings 11. 7 and 33 and the 2nd Kings 23, so I don't know where you're looking. Oh, it is 2nd Kings 23. Maybe I just... Verse 13. Um, yeah, let's see. Oh, okay. And the other one was 1st Kings 11? Yes. Looks like at that. Oh, that's Solomon and his wives. Maybe it's not Chemos then. But let's look at that Second Kings twenty three real quick. Um, the let's see, Josiah. This was after Josiah had found the law. You know, the law was found during this reign. And then um, let's go down to verse ten. He desecrated Topheth, which was in the valley of Beth Hinnom, so no one could use it to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire to Molech. He removed from the entrance to the temple of the Lord the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They were in a court near the room of an official named Nathan Melech, kind of a similar name to Molech there. Josiah then burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. He pulled down the altars of the kings of Judah, the, that the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz, the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. How offensive there. He removed them from there, smashed them to pieces, and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem on the south 
of the hill of corruption, the one Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Asherah, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, for Chemos, the vile god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the sites with human bones. So I think this was extremely significant that they had built, you know, Manasseh had built um, two, uh, well, altars in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. That, you know, talk about going on to the home turf and being offensive. That is shockingly offensive. I want to find the story here that Sherry is speaking of, and I'm having trouble finding it, but it's, um, it is a significant story. Let's see. It is, and it was um, in, in a book club that I'm in. We uh -huh. read uh, the series, The Chronicle of the Kings by Lynn Austin, Interesting. and she does a really good job of bringing in scripture, but also, you know, she adds a little fiction to it as well, because it is Christian fiction, uh -huh. but she does a really good job of describing how horrible it is that this king, and I think it was Manasseh, now that you say that name, threw his children into the, the way she described it was into the mouth of the idol that had a, the burning furnace and it was you know it was it it was very logical the way she described it I mean it, it could totally have been that way we don't know but it oh, just sure. was one of those things of the way she described it just made it seem all the more how in the world did they ever get to a point of sacrificing their children to a piece of stone i mean it just oh isn't that awful i mean it, is. it just was shockingly awful yeah it is and it, you know it's one of those things so when you read about it, it's easy i think to kind of read past it and think oh you know it's a, it is very price. easy it's, it's, yeah. it's horrible so awful i'm determined to find this even at the cost of a quality lesson here. oh just kidding the uh, i don't want to mess that up but we will find it. Let's say it's 2 Kings 21, see if it's there. If it's not there, I'll give up on it for now. Answer it next week. 2 Kings 21. But yes, I think, you know, and that's why I mentioned don't get drawn in by these things because people do get drawn in by these things, you know? It's horrible. Yeah, here we go. It's uh, 2 Kings 21. 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. He reigned for 55 years, which is pretty incredible for that time. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and she did evil, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal, made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, the king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord of which the Lord said, in Jerusalem, I will put my name. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced sorcery and divination, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil and eyes the Lord, provoking him to anger. He took the carved asher pole he had made and put it in the temple, of which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I've chosen, out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not again make the feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their forefathers, if only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them and will keep the whole law that my servant Moses gave them. But the people did not listen. Manasseh led them astray. So they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. Extremely shocking. Truly horrible. So, you know, people do get drawn into these things. And, you know, I it would seem like, I've always thought that it would seem if you were honored to be the king of the nation, and God had said, you know, essentially, I'm making you the king of this nation, that you would follow God. Unfortunately, 
they followed all these detestable practices of the peoples around them. People always want to be like other people, you know, and it's kind of sad rather than naturally wanting to be like God or, you know, and following after God's footsteps. So that is, that is a very shocking um, situation. So let me, uh, we're going to, we have five minutes. I want to read, actually, we're right by this anyway, just in realize at the time, 2 Kings 17. This was after some degree of the exile uh, because of the sin of the northern kingdom. Manasseh was the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, but in the northern kingdom, Samaria was established. And we know the story of Jesus and uh, going to the Samaritan woman. We know the story of the good Samaritan. You know, these were half-breed people, for lack of a better term, and that's a very politically incorrect term, but it was true. They were not considered to be quality people by the Israelites of the day. That was a historical truth. And so the king, this is first Kings second, excuse me, second Kings 17, 24. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvam and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in its town. So he specifically brought in foreign people so that they would not have this area of Israel for their own. Uh, they took over Samaria, lived in Samson. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord. So he sent lions among them, and they killed some of the people. It was reported to the king of Assyria, the people you deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria, do not know what the God of the country requires. He has sent lions among them, which are killing them off because people do not know what he requires. It's really interesting to me that they immediately identified this was a problem with God sending the lions. You know, it, it, uh, it was the nature of the day, I guess. Then the king of Assyria gave this order, have one of the priests you took captive from Samaria go back and live there and teach the people what the God of the land requires. So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came to live in Bethel and taught them how to worship the Lord. Remember, it was Hiel of Bethel, Hiel, Hiel of Bethel, who rebuilt the uh, city of Jericho. So Bethel played prominently in this time. Nevertheless, each na national group made its own gods in the several towns where they settled and set them up in the shrines the people of Samaria had made in the high places. The men from Babylon made Sukkoth Bina, the men from Kutha made Nergal, the men from Hamath made Ashima, the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sepharvites burned their children in the fire as sacrifices to Dremelech and Anamelech, the gods of Sepharvaim. It's interesting, nobody really knows where Sepharvaim was, and I have a feeling this is why. I think God took care of them in his way, and Sefer Bam remains lost to history. They worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines at the high places. They worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. To this day, they persist in their former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor adhere to the decrees and ordinances, the laws and commands that the Lord gave the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. When the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, he commanded them, do not worship any other gods or bow down to them, serve them or sacrifice them. But the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt with mighty power and outstretched arm is the one you must worship. To him you shall bow down and to him offer sacrifices. You must always be careful to keep the decrees and ordinances the laws and commands he wrote for you. Do not worship other gods. Do not forget the covenant I made with you and do not worship other gods. Rather worship the Lord your God it is he who will deliver you from the hand of your enemies. Sadly here, they would not listen, however, but they persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue as their fathers did. So, you know, obviously a very important passage, not only explaining why Samaria was hated by the Israelites and considered a, uh, an inferior land, but 
maybe you know far more importantly explaining the problem with the false gods nearby and the fact that god expects to be the only god worshiped and that's a lesson for us today too now i think it's interesting that um manasseh worshiped the stars and you know there are still those who gaze upon stars moon cycles you know we all i hear way too much people saying oh you must be a you know taurus because you just said hello to me i think well what a strange thing to say somebody that you know why try to decide some odd moon cycle when barely knowing me and i guess it's sort of a somewhat of an evangelistic odd way to try to get somebody interested in astrology but i've never understood that i think it's really odd and uh you know i think the idea that a daily horoscope is still published when there's as far as i know no daily bible verse or daily prayer like there kind of used to be in newspapers is kind of a sad statement on our society as well so all those things play roles in spiritual warfare next week we'll talk about i'm wrapping up for this week we'll have our prayer here in a minute but next week we'll talk about the um what we can do about spiritual warfare and does or you know these spiritual influences and does it still matter today? Uh, and I think that's a fair question to answer because I think a lot of people look at scripture and you know we've spent a lot of time in the Old Testament, today all Old Testament. Last week, however, we were in the New Testament talking about how they're comparing Jesus to Beelzebub. And so, and again, Beelzebub was their term for Satan. So these things are very real and obvious and findable too in the New Testament. It's just the stories of the false gods that happen to be in the Old Testament. So we'll talk about the what do we as modern day Christians do about spiritual warfare. And um, that my plan is that we'll wrap up next week and at least for Mother's Day, the two weeks from today, we won't have a meeting and then we'll decide what we're doing or after that, if anything. So. We'll kind of look at the schedule and see, but I think having Mother's Day off is a, a fair thing. I get called mom half the time. Uh, oh, well, wait, no, this, that's not the reason. But the um, it is important to celebrate mom, so we will celebrate them that.